Hi, how's your dog doing? Okay, so if you don't care about any channel stuff or you're new to the channel, um, please skip this intro part. You can find that in the chapters or the timestamps, whatever I called it for this video. Um, so what I'm gonna start with here is just like some general stuff. So you can skip that if you don't really care about it. Uh, so we're back with another unscripted video. Isn't that fun? Um, but this one's actually related to Tolkipona for once. And I should have a regular like, scripted video about Tolkipona coming out uh, pretty soon. Maybe within like the next week or two or something like that. So I do have that in the works. So do not worry if you hate these unscripted videos. The, the regular formatted ones will return. And again, if you guys want me to make more of those, just, just tell me. These ones are easier, they're faster to make, so... Um, for example, this week when I was kind of in a pinch and I didn't really have the script for that for, for that um, scripted video already and everything, I just decided why not make this video because it's an idea I've had and I'm going to talk about it, and why not? And uh, I might make this into a regular scripted video anyway, I just want to get my ideas out here for the time being at least. I, I might make it into like a regular format of video to pare down and make my points more concise and stuff like that but i don't know for now it's gonna be how it is there'll be no graphics here it might just be a couple of pictures and stuff so so um you can kind of treat this as a podcast of sorts i guess so yeah um so we're gonna bring some philosophy in here um and mix that with tokipona which i personally i feel that um just uh, the philosophical school of thought of Tokipona itself is kind of downplayed, which is Taoism generally, but I, it also connects to other things in any way. Um, so first off, I feel like that's kind of a, a part of the language that's not really talked about as much. You know, everyone's talking about adding new words or um, coming up with different writing systems and uh, uh making up numbers systems and coming up with stuff for the grammar and all that stuff but people don't really talk about not only the philosophical implications but also the ideas behind tokipona as much and while this one's not exactly the ideas behind tokipona this is kind of an idea that i can it's sort of an idea i can associate with tokipona um i still think i still think it's a relevant thing to bring up also this unscripted video might be shorter i don't know i <laughs> clearly don't know because I'm just speaking, not writing it out. So maybe it is shorter. I don't know. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about here is about Tokipona and Wittgenstein. This is an idea I have brought up in a previous video on the limits of language. Um, but this video will be solely dedicated to that, whereas that video was using that as a point for other things I want to talk about. So if you're interested, go watch that video, you know, for fun and more views for me. So, so I will definitely appreciate if you watch that video. <laughs> so to start out, let's clarify some things so that we're on the same page here, or at least on a similar page here. And we, we're on a general part of the story. You can kind of generally understand what we're talking about. And so that it's not like we're, you know, there's no difference of understanding between me and you. Uh, so Wittgenstein, he was, uh, 20th century analytic philosopher, that's not very important, um, but essentially the main idea that, well, he had two main ideas. He had one earlier in his career and then one that, one essentially completely opposite to what his earlier work later in his career. I generally prefer his later work because I find it kind of matches more with um, reality and um, current linguistic knowledge. <laughs> rather than the other one, which is a little more of a philosophical approach to it, or um, even a mathematical approach to it. But um, his his dealings were with, mostly with language, and a little bit of maths, but that's, you know, that's kind of mostly language. That's mostly what he was focused on, philosophy of language. Um, so essentially, Wittgenstein's uh, later idea, which is what I'm going to be using here, because I kind of prefer that, as I just mentioned, um, is that uh, words and language in general doesn't really have in inherent meaning in and of itself um so like words don't really have meanings they have uses and from those uses we derive meaning um so for example rather famous example he gives <laughs> if you've read philosophical investigations which is um which is where um 
like most of this is coming from he gives an example of an apple um like not an apple but the word apple an apple can refer to um to us an apple refers to this fruit hopefully i'm showing a picture of it <laughs> um but even then we might have different variations of that fruit like even if we're assuming that apple means just the type of fruit right that we all would kind of agree is an apple someone would be thinking of a gala apple someone might be thinking of a honeycrisp apple someone might be thinking of a granny smith apple someone might be thinking of a macintosh apple a brayburn apple someone might be thinking of a jazz apple someone might be thinking of a you get the point <laughs> There are a lot of different kinds of apples, so I'm not going to really get into that right here. Uh, but even within just if we if we use that as like our definition, there is a lot of variation within that. When I imagine an apple, the image of an apple, I probably am imagining it as a gala apple, like, you know, like a little bit of like a skinny or like a standard apple shape. But when I imagine the taste of an apple, I mostly think of a honey crisp apple, which is which they look different. And the word apple can also not even just mean that when you think about it. Um, for example, in English, apple used to just refer to any kind of fruit, which um, is a similar phenomenon in French. I almost want to say German, but I'm not sure. Um, I know that, like, for example, the word for potato literally means apple uh, in French. The word for potato literally means earth apple. I, I think is something similar in German, but I'm not entirely sure. So do not quote me on that at all. So if you kind of see where I'm going with this, you can tell that the only way we can really tell what words mean is when we're using them. And it's within a certain context. And Wittgenstein calls the different uses or these different contexts in which we use words language games. So like, if you kind of want to get it, it's like there are different rules for different language games. So like, Maybe we're both playing a, I don't know, maybe we're both playing a language game where when I say apple, you give me an apple. That's a specific language game. And the rules of that language game are, if I say apple, you give me this object, this, maybe not like a specific apple, but like the, this object. Hopefully, again, I am showing it on screen so that way I don't have to like say it and explain it everything, but you get the idea. I mean, the picture of the apple, so, you know, I don't have to use the word apple when defining an apple as well. Um, so hopefully that, that all makes sense, that um, words do have different meanings depending on their context, and um, that context is between the speakers, so you can only really use a word properly in its proper context. All the different ideas you can associate a word with, that's what Wittgenstein calls family resemblances, because they're not exactly the same. They're just kind of similar. They all resemble each other in some way. They're all reminiscent of each other. So, like a family resemblance. Like, for example, take the word um, game, which is another word that Wittgenstein uses as an example in philosophical investigations. Like, there's not, ex like, there's not exactly one thing. I'll get to this in a second. I'll explain that in a little bit. But there's not exactly one thing that unites... Um, chess, um, basketball, Monopoly, I Spy, the quiet game as many parents like to use and teachers, uh, <laughs> and to use a more pop culture e example wordle <laughs> there's not exactly something in common with all of those different things i like a thing that's like in common so what do you mean by a thing that's in common with all of these this is an idea that wittgenstein refutes which is what he calls the name theory of language which is that we treat like in to us to most people we treat words as if they represent ideas or concepts like for example never mind wait no but to most people 
words are almost like they're names for certain things. Like, for example, um, again, this between Wittgenstein, again, like his stuff. Um, Socrates would go around and ask people, like, what's justice? What's truth? What's knowledge? And it's it, it's like he was looking for a thing that these things represent. If that makes sense. People would give answers like, oh, justice is when I do something that's just. Like, not, not that that's not the definition they'd give, but do something that is just. Like, such as... Um, Justice is when I stop a criminal or the truth is when I know that this thing exists, something along those lines. And Socrates would keep on saying, no, that's not what I'm asking about. What what is just what is knowledge? What is truth? As if these were things that the words knowledge, justice and truth or um, in Greek, I forgot what they are. I remember I looked them up to use for some purpose um but he was acting as if those were just names for whatever truth justice and knowledge are if that makes sense they're just treating it like a name and that's how we generally go around treating things we ask um like what is that or what are these things like if you learn a new word you might ask what is that you might not ask what does it mean you ask what is it as if that's its name. Like if I were to say ornithology, and you didn't know that, and you were to ask, ornithology, what is that? You're treating it as if it's a name for the study of birds, which it's not. It's not a name for it. Ornithology is just a word that we use in that context to mean the study of birds. If you if you understand that good because that's probably going to be the most i'm going to really explain wittgenstein's ideas i'm going to finally move on if you don't i recommend that there there are probably some videos you can find just by looking wittgenstein up or maybe even like later wittgenstein something like that or you can go read philosophical investigations something like that if you want to have a better understanding of that if you're more interested in that and something like that um if you're more interested in his ideas and maybe i can make another video on him because he's one of my favorite philosophers so there's that and for anyone who's interested in philosophy and is coming to this video for some reason i will just quickly explain what tokipona is so that you can get the idea and the gist so that you can see how it relates to wittgenstein once i explain it so tokipona is a con language which means a constructed language meaning that it was created by someone did not arise naturally it was created by sonia lang uh, a canadian linguist in 2001 and this language has currently 137 official words that are in common usage. And these words, uh, and these words have pretty broad meanings where they encompass many different, they encompass a general semantic space, which just means like you, like for example, the word delo means like water, drink, beverage, it like encompasses like all those ideas in one and so it, it it's meant to be a very simple language and to simplify your thoughts so you can really um, think about what things are to you it's so that you can kind of get rid of all that clutter in your mind and think about good thoughts and think about things more simply rather than thinking of them as very complex things now that is very oversimplified and if you really want to learn more about tokipona you should go read about it um you should go maybe to the tokipona subreddit you can read tokipona the language of good um i have a couple i have pretty much one video and like a couple of youtube shorts about tokipona so you can learn some of the basics of it i will probably make more content related to tokipona learning at some point in the future i mean i never know where i'm gonna go with that i might i might make some more content for it I've had like some ideas about doing some natural method type things. That's not important right now, but yeah, if you want to learn more, I have some videos on that. Uh, there are other videos on that. There's a there's a book about it. There's all kinds of stuff. You can go research it yourself. But the important part is it's a very simple language, very context dependent based on the simplicity of all the words and the amount of the words. Okay, so finally, 
we can actually get to how these two things relate to each other. So as I said in that limits of language video, the one where I kind of thought of this idea in, I kind of see Tokipona as a very good representation or a very good demonstration of Wittgenstein's idea of language games. Because like I said less than a minute ago, Tokipona is a very context dependent language. A lot of what you can communicate is based on where you are, who you're talking to, what the topic is, all this different stuff. And that is how meaning is communicated. Now, um, a lot of people think that you can't communicate in Tokipona because of its simplicity. You absolutely can. You can communicate just as well as with any other language. Just Tokipona requires more context. And when you really think about it, English, as a language, requires a lot of context as well. Just not as much as Okipona does. Like for example, when you say the word they, they just means an unspecified person or multiple unspecified people. And that is all you can derive from the word they. No more meaning can be extracted from that word unless you have the proper context. Because most of the time, when you say the word they, you are probably referring to a very specific person or a very specific group of people or a very specific type of person. Like when you say something like, um, if this person were to do this, they should, you know, like a specific type of person rather than a specific individual. So when you use the word they, it's a very specific person that you're talking about or a specific group of people. To linguistics, uh, these kinds of words like that, like they, their, that, this, not these types of words, but this phenomenon is called dyxis or dyxis. Um, there's not like an agreed upon pronunciation, but the point that these are words where they don't inherently mean something on their own but they only mean, or they do refer to something very specific when in the proper context. So as you can see, when whenever you use a deitic expression, that is a language game. Because whoever you're speaking to has to know who you're referring to, or they're at least they're expected to know who you're referring to, or what type of person you're referring to. That is a language game that you're engaging in right there. And Tokipona does this, but to a much larger extent. English only really does this with its deictic words, like the ones I just said, like they, their, he, she, this, that, words like those. And I guess English also does this with individuals as well. For example, if you were to just say dog, that does not necessarily refer to any specific dog. It just means a dog. It refers to a member of the species Canis lupus familiaris. Sorry to use my Latin pronunciation, but I can't help it. That is all you can tell from the word dog. So generally, English deictic expressions only really are semantically vague. And by that, I mean the word itself can tell you nothing else about the thing when it refers to individuals. However, Tokipona takes this a step further. And I don't want to say that all, a lot of its words are deictic in that way, but a lot of its words are inherently context dependent. They are not just vague when referring to individuals. They are vague when referring to like the things that are being talked about that aren't the individual, like the group as well. Like, for example, if I were to say the word soeli, which in Tokipona can refer to any animal or more specifically a land mammal, at best, all you can know from the word soeli is that I'm referring to a land mammal. And even that is context dependent. If I say the word kala, which means a water animal, at best, all you know is that it is an animal that lives in the water. So all the meaning is really derived from the context, the language game. 
this word doesn't really have too much use on its own without a language game. You might ask, well, why can't we use words outside of a language game? Well, Wittgenstein sees it as mo people do do this all the time, namely philosophers. They take words, like for example, with Socrates again, like truth, justice, and knowledge, and they take them outside of their language games. And outside of the game, they die. Now, what do I mean by outside of the game, they die? Clearly, these words have meaning, right? Right? Well, look at it this way. As an example from this YouTube video by Y. Alexander Y, I believe the name is, um, which is which is a good resource for learning about Wittgenstein's later work. Like, let's say a regular person was playing chess, right? If you Wittgenstein, another a philosopher is another person who comes up and asks the chess player, what does this mean and points at a pawn? So the chess player says, this is a pawn. What it does is it moves forward one space or two spaces if it's its first move and it can capture diagonally. But then to Wittgenstein, the philosopher essentially picks up the pawn, the word, and, at, and takes it out of the chessboard, takes it out of its context where it means something and asks, now what does it mean? The pawn means nothing outside of the game. The word means essentially nothing outside of context. Now again, with English, this is most obvious with its deictic words, its deictic expressions. But Tokipona essentially does this with most of its words, pretty much all of them. However, there are some words that are very specific, which were coined as jokes, like kokosila, which means to speak a non-Tokipona language in a Tokipona environment, or a kiete santakalu, which means um, a mustelid. But even that's vague. Like, it doesn't specify if it's like a raccoon or a ferret or a weasel. So that's even that is very vague in and of itself. But that's what I'm saying. Tokipona is it, it's a very good demonstration of what Wittgenstein was saying. That words only really mean something in context. Most Tokipona words only really mean something in the proper context. So when I say soeli all on its own, at, again, at best, all you can know about that is that I might be referring to some land mammal. However, in context, you will most likely know exactly what I am talking about. If I am over at your house and I say soeli, and you have one pet, and that's a cat, you will know that when I say soeli, I'm referring to a cat. The word soeli only really works in the right context. And that's not to say that tokipona only works in context in person with other people. You, you can still speak it effectively without context. You can still speak it effectively even if you're not like with another person, you can still speak it perfectly fine over the internet and whatnot. Just specifics are probably gonna have to be clarified. Tokipona words themselves do not convey any meaning beside general definitions. If you wanna be more specific, you have to just describe it. And even then, there is still technically room for interpretation. So even if you try to describe your cat using soeli and much other adjectives to describe it, like, uh, for example, soelipoki, which literally means container land mammal, but would mean box animal because cats like to be in boxes. That would only really make sense either A, to someone who speaks Tokipona, or B, to someone who's not really familiar and just in the community. It only makes sense if they are aware of that conception of cats as being animals that love boxes. If you never grew up around cats or you never lived in an area where cats are a common pet, you would have no idea what I mean when I say soelipoki. Even that is still dependent on context. It is still dependent on a language game. The words are still just pawns in their game. They are still just pieces within their games used to convey information. So now that we've talked about this and we've explained it, what can we do with it? As I've explained in a previous video, 
What you need is knowledge and a system to get better at things and to be happier with your life. So, now that we have this knowledge, what's the system we can use it in? So, for a tokiponist, I would say that this should lead you to think way more about the context in which you're saying things. It really gets you to realize your conceptions about different things, which are dependent on contexts. For example, your culture. Now, I think Tokipona gets you thinking about the way you see things way more than other languages do. For example, the way that I call a cat a soelipoki already shows the way that I conceive of it. However, with this idea from Wittgenstein it takes it a step further, you can now kind of start to understand why you see things those ways, not just that you see in those ways. This still lines up with Wittgenstein. Unlike most other philosophers, Wittgenstein prioritized clarity and lucidity over truth. He wanted to know what he was seeing and completely understand it and see it clearly. This helps you do that. This helps you look at how you see the world in a clear way. This also helps you with ease of communication. For example, let's say you are a Christian and you want to talk about a church. For example, let's say you are, let's say you're religious. I don't know if you are. I don't, I don't really care. This is, not, this is just a thought experiment. Now let's just say that you are a Christian and you want to talk about your church. However, you're talking about your church to someone from a different country where another religion is more dominant. Let's just say it's Islam. And you would normally say Tomo Sewi, which would mean like a divine, a divine building or like a divine structure or uh, maybe even a godly building, something along those lines, generally conveying the idea of it having to do with a supernatural being that in this case, a god or being divine, or being holy or religious in a building. Now, you're trying to say church, but maybe that other person thinks you're saying mosque. This is all context-dependent. They come from a different culture with a different context. So when you would say tomosewi, that the language game that they would normally be playing would make them think that you're talking about a mosque. If you're talking to a Jewish person, they might think they're talking about a synagogue. You know, uh, just to use Abrahamic religions, I guess. And again, even let's assume you're a Christian, even in this thought experiment, even within this thought experiment where you're a Christian, you might say Tomu Sewi, and, and you might be thinking of like a big cathedral or, uh, you know, all this stuff or like a big monastery or something like that. You know, you're thinking of like this big majestic cathedral and someone else is thinking of like a smaller church you know what i mean like even within the language game you're playing there's still room for it so you should so for toki ponist try to think of how specific you have to be thinking think about all the context that comes into this think of the exact language game that you're playing naturally and then one of the other person could be playing naturally another example maybe let's say you're an american a lot of americans drink coffee and you want to say the word maybe you say telo seli for coffee which literally means hot drink if you were talking to someone from most of the world but for example let's just say east asia tea is more commonly consumed worldwide and also specifically in east asia in other places than in the United States. So you might be saying teloseli and thinking coffee, but the person you're talking to will hear you say teloseli and think you're talking about tea. You have to be thinking about all the different contexts coming into this, all the different cultures and different backgrounds someone can have. You think about not even just the language game you're playing with them, but you also have to think about what different language games they could be playing with other people around them and the ones that you play around other people around you. I think Tokipona is a great way to start thinking about this stuff and really think about how language games affect how we communicate with each other 
and how important context is for language. So this whole Wittgenstein thing helps you to be more specific with your communication so you can be as exact as possible and communicate as well as possible. Now for the more philosophically inclined you came because I'm talking about Wittgenstein here. Um, I guess this is just encouraging you to learn Tokipona, which again, you might want to stay around this channel more. I might have some more videos related to that, so stay tuned for that. <laughs> A little plug there, but you might think, oh yeah, Wittgenstein's really cool, I really like his ideas, but I don't really know how I can apply this to my daily life. Tokipona is a great way to get into thinking about this sort of thing. It's not the only language in which you can think about it. It's a really good one that forces you to think about it. Tokipona is a great way to really get you thinking about language games and context, as I have just explained earlier for the Tokiponists. Then you can apply all this stuff that you're learning and using through Tokipona into any other languages you want to learn. Um, English, I'd assume since you're watching this video, and even other languages that you're learning in the future. And you could think this when you're learning another language. Think, what context would this word mean this thing? Can't really think of any examples, but... Yeah, may maybe one culture has a different conception of something that your culture doesn't, of the exact same thing. Like, maybe one culture sees, like, clouds and rain as being a good thing because they live in, like, a desert where that's pretty good to have, rain. But we see it as more of a sad thing and a bad thing. Which is evident when, uh, at least in the West, when well, a lot of words in Romance languages for storms... I actually don't know why I'm saying that. My only experience is from Spanish. Um, and, yeah, it's really only from Spanish and Latin. But the Spanish word for storm is tormenta, which would probably make you think torment. <laughs> so yeah, we generally see that as more of a negative thing. So that's also kind of for polyglots as well, or aspiring polyglots, but also for those who are philosophically inclined. So this, so learning Tokipona would get you to think about this stuff more, so that way when you speak in English, you can think about this stuff more and more to try and be as clear as possible and to better understand the language games that you are speaking in. Okay, so I'm really starting to run out of ideas now. Um, this is running out of ideas. Um, that Those are kind of the main points I wanted to bring up again. I might condense this into a more like regularly formatted video so that people can understand the points and not to sit through like 30 minutes of audio to get here. But yeah. Um, so please tell me if you like this video. Uh, I've enjoyed recording it. I don't, I don't really spend too much time making these unscripted videos. I just kind of enjoy talking and exploring these ideas more so than like formulating a script and editing so much and here listening to the audio and all this different stuff. But um, tell me if you enjoyed this video. If you hate the unscripted videos and you want me to get rid of them, please tell me that I, I want to make sure that I'm doing what people enjoy because... You know, I, I want to make sure that the stuff I make is enjoyable for others as well. This isn't just for me. <laughs> um, but again, if you like these unscripted videos, um, I, I know I've said this so many times, but I can make more of these more often. The real trouble with that is just coming up with good ideas rather than getting those ideas out. Because I could make a video like this in about three hours, whereas it could take me upwards of like five hours, upwards of, depending on the length of the video, it could take me somewhere from, it could take me like five hours, six hours, seven hours to make a regular video. Depending on how long it is. Like if I wanted to make a video that's 30 minutes long, that would take like a really long time that would take a good eight hours something like that nine ten hours some maybe not okay maybe i'm exaggerating well actually no if it's a regularly formatted video i'd include a lot of editing and all that stuff so it, it could in theory take like 10 hours if i am also like really slow but These ones are generally more fat. These ones are generally faster to make than the regular ones. I can crank one of these out in three hours. So, there's that.
Um, tell me if you enjoyed the concept. Any ideas you want to contribute, please put those in the comments. Um... Uh, so there's not much else to say, so I hope you enjoyed the video, and tell your dog said hi.